Welcome to The Haunted Mansion, an interactive horror story in which you direct the outcome. At moments throughout the video, you'll be given a choice as to which direction to take the story. Simply go to the time code displayed on screen to change the outcome of the story. You can find the time codes in the description or pinned comment below. It's time to make some decisions, so hit the lights, sit back, and enjoy. Halloween night was a special night in Wallenberg, the one day a year the cynical citizens of the oft-sleepy New England village would muster any semblance of passion or pizzazz and come together to celebrate the ghosts of yesteryear. Honouring their colonial era roots as a town bombarded with witch trials and pagan paranoia, Wallenberg's finest dressed the streets with black tinsel and jack-o'-lanterns galore. At night the village would glow with a subtle menace the carved faces of emotionless ghouls lining the cobblestone roads, reminding passers-by there was more than meets the eye within the limits of Wallenberg. Storefronts set up skeletons in their window displays as the leaves from the oaks guarding the village turned a vibrant orange, and slowly cascaded citizens with a flurry of autumnal spirits. The air changed every year on October 31st and everyone knew it. Ambivalent to the invisible manifestations of witchcraft and a history with dread were the children of Wallenberg, who saw Halloween night as nothing more than a filter for imagination and the tastiest treats in all of New England. They never seemed the least bit phased by lurking omens in the cobblewebbed alleyways or the Wallenberg elders, who seemed to dress from another era, hovering up and down Main Street without ever saying a word. They were probably just fancy high-end costumes, the children thought, Surely there were no such things as actual ghosts. In the end, it didn't matter, for Beggar's Night dominated their focus, and the haunts of Wallenberg's shadows lingered undisturbed. Not all the villagers' youth were fooled by the festive traditions, however. There came an age where the cheap costumes and heaping piles of candy lost their luster, and rebellious teenagers preferred to hang out in rustic attics with candlesticks and horror flicks instead staying inside away from the bitter Atlantic winds and in the warmth of ghost stories. It was certainly the desired hangout for the three closest friends in all of Allenburg, the trio of Chasen, Jackie, and Newman, foregoing trick-or-treating to play games of their own. That year, the triad picked Chasen's treehouse in his family's woodland backyard to hold their annual Halloween game night. It was built when Chasen, a brown-haired, blue-eyed daredevil with an addiction to adrenaline, was merely a boy and his father, a construction foreman, hailing from Boston, built he and his kindergarten friends an escape in the treetops. Ever since, Chasen and his friends used the treehouse to hide from their troubles and forge a bond of their own. Newman, a scrawny football player, peculiarly afraid of heights, always hated climbing the rickety ladder all the way up the towering oak, but was always tasked with bringing the snacks and couldn't let his two best friends down. Jackie, an unusually resourceful girl with a devoted heart for Halloween, always knew exactly how to spook the two boys, who always misjudged her ability to up the ante and reteach what it meant to feel alive. That year, it was nothing different. We've been waiting all day for this, Jackie. We just want to know what we're about to get ourselves into, Newman said as he threw an acorn from the window of the treehouse. My guess is she doesn't really have anything planned, but is too embarrassed to admit it. Chasen chimed in, a smug look on his face. Come on, guys. Can't we enjoy a little relaxation before I scare the souls straight out of your bodies? Jackie retorted, sporting a devilish little smile herself. The sun is setting, Newman explained. We're going to have to go home soon. It's Saturday night. Since when do you have a curfew on the weekend? Chasen asked, perplexed. Oh right, Newman blushed, throwing another acorn from their perch. How about a game of truth or dare, Jackie proposed. Truth or dare, Newman clarified fatuously. First Newman with a Saturday night curfew, now you propose this. Did I enter an alternate dimension? How old are you two? Twelve? Chasen asked, growing impatient. Truth or dare is different when you're older. We've got more secrets to share. No one expecting us home at a certain time. The possibilities are endless, and what a better night to play than Halloween. Jackie propositioned to his skeptical friends. Alright, you go first then, Chasen asked. Truth or dare? Truth, Jackie replied, no hesitation. 
Have you ever seriously considered killing someone? Chasen asked, attempting to sound stern, his eyebrows furrowed. Not until about three seconds ago, did you honestly expect another answer? Jackie questioned. You're horrible at this, Chasen. It's my turn. Truth or dare? Newman asked. Truth, Chasen replied. Were you the one who pulled the fire alarm last year on the first day of school? Chasen cracked an even bigger smile. Jackie groaned across from him. We all knew it was Chasen. You guys are horrible at this. Asking stupid questions everyone already knows the truth to. Fine, fine, Newman relented, sitting up and focusing on Jackie. Ask me. Jackie stared back at Newman, square in the eyes. Their gazes locked in. Truth or dare, she asked. Dare me, Newman demanded. I dare to lead us to Maple Heart Manor, break in under full moon, and explore its haunted rooms, Jackie responded. Newman's face drained of colour, his eyes filling with sadness. He fidgeted in his seat. You didn't actually want to play truth or dare, you just wanted to fool us into getting into one of your little Halloween hijinks, he accused. And here you are, Jackie replied. It worked. Maple Heart Manor has been broken into time and time again for over a hundred years, there's no way we even get close to the property line, much less the house itself. Amateur ghost hunters have been trying since before we were born. No way a few teenagers even sniff the front door, Newman reasoned. You see, that's what everyone thinks, but Halloween gives us the perfect cover. We throw on some costumes to camouflage us all the way to Maple Heart Boulevard, then sneak through the trees and bypass the gate security. It's foolproof, Jackie explained. It's suicide, is what it is, Newman retorted. What are you, scared? Chasen chimed in. First of heights, now of a little old haunted house. Does your coach know you're this much of a wimp? Newman stood up, puffing his chest out. I can handle a dare, Chasen, but can you? Because now I dare both of you to come with me. You can't do that, Chasen whined, deflating a little himself. Sure he can, Jackie reasoned, and you shouldn't complain either, Chasen. You're always desperate for that next adventure. Plus, I'm sure that both of you have heard about the Mapleheart treasure supposedly hidden somewhere in the house. Isn't all the riches in the world enough to get you to break a few rules? Chasen thought long and hard before nodding. I brought a few flashlights with me, they're in my car. We'll drive to the centre of town, park outside of Willoughby's, and walk the rest of the way on foot, Jackie instructed. Sounds like a plan? One last question, what costumes are you wearing? Newman asked. Jackie smiled and started to descend the treehouse ladder a smile still growing across her face. A couple of hours later, three figures dressed like dying willow trees emerged from the shadows between the actual willows of Wallenberg's countryside. They blended in with the scenery to perfection, as if the branches of the willows danced under the light of the crescent moon. Jackie, Chasen and Newman all took off their masks simultaneously, looking up at the monstrosity before them. Perched on the top of a small hill was Maple Heart Manor, a massive, towering mansion with more chimneys than a steamboat and a crumbling facade. It almost beckoned the early evening fog to cloak its ominous positioning. Around the teenagers, the night was still outside of a nearby owl, watching over the abandoned property, hooting as it received visitors for the first time in months. Your plan is brilliant, Newman said to Jackie, in awe of the enormity of the manor. We're still not in yet, Chasen remarked. Jackie looked at him amused by his scepticism. Lead the way then. Chasen put his tree mask back on his face and stomped to the front of the group, thrashing through the tall grass to create a path to potential doom. At the front door of the haunted mansion was a massive plywood sign that read no trespassing. Down the middle of the poster ran a crack where the door had busted through. Remnants of trespassers long gone. Someone had attempted to chain the front door handles together but it wasn't taut enough to prevent a small slither from forming in the doorway, a slither small enough for three lanky teenagers to squeeze through. The three friends stop in their tracks one more time. Should we knock, Newman asks, innocently. No, we should be as quiet as possible. No sudden noises, Jackie replied. Yeah, ghosts don't like sudden noises, Chasen agreed. Newman, it was your dare. You go in first, Jackie said. Newman didn't speak in response, but rather turned back to look at the two lifelong pals, fear fastened to his eye sockets. 
a bead of sweat forming on his brow. He faced forward again, blood draining from his rosy cheeks, and slid through the charred cherry doors. Inside the entryway were high vaulted ceilings, a chandelier the size of a blue whale hanging by a crystal chain in the centre. The stained glass windows were too dusty to allow in much light, casting an indigo glow across the foyer. Furniture draped by old bedsheets and mothball-ridden tablecloths sat scattered about, making literal ghosts stand at attention as the trio all huddled up in the mouth of the Maple Heart Manor. Hello, Jackie called out, her voice echoing through the grand staircase. Chasen looked at her as if worms were burrowed in her ears. I thought the point of being quiet was to be sure we don't let someone know we're here. Or something, Newman added, shining his flashlight around the open entryway. I can promise you, if there was anybody or anything in here, it would have made itself known already. Uh, Jackie, Newman whispered, pointing his torch at the ceiling. What about those? The screech of a thousand bats pierced the musty air as Newman's beam of light disturbed a sleeping cloud of the flying mammals from above. They cascaded over the teenagers, forming a tornado of flapping wings, their cries sharper than nails on a chalkboard. Chasen had the foresight to grab the front door and push with all of his might to open up the slit, wide enough for the bats to sense a way outside. Just as the bats closed in, they felt the draft of the breeze outside and screamed through the gap, their cacophony fading out into the night. Can we leave now, Newman pleaded. Jackie grinned, a look of horror on her face quickly becoming one of excitement. But we only just got to you. We have to honour the dare. No excuses. Chase finally let go of the door trying to hide his anxiety, slicking his hair back and taking a deep breath. I agree, let's go. Jackie turned her own flashlight on and shined it to her left and her right, revealing two doors propped open. Let's wait to go upstairs and explore the ground floor first, she suggested. Where to first? Chasen looked to the left, where a tiled floor and cooking appliances could be seen through the doorway facing him. The kitchen, he said. The three friends walked slowly across the foyer into the kitchen, Jackie guiding them without fear. The kitchen door creaked open as Jackie gently pushed with one hand, her flashlight shaking in the other. Sterling silver prep tables that once shined now sat covered with mold and mildew. Old rusty pots and pans hung from the ceilings tipped over rice bags and flour barrels covering the floor with decades-old food. A few rats scattered across the floor, nibbling on stale breadcrumbs. First bats, now rats, Newman observed. It's almost too convenient. I hate rats, Chasen said, shooting looks of disgust at the disease-ridden rodents running about. Almost as if it heard Chasen's nonchalant musing, the biggest rat in probably the entire manor leapt from a rotting cabinet and onto the floor. It ran towards the three friends, honing in on Chasen, its two front fangs sharp as razors. Chasen didn't hesitate and jumped onto one of the prep tables as Newman and Jackie scrambled to get away. The rat kept after Chasen, ignoring the others. He pulled out his flashlight and swung it at the rat as it climbed up the table leg, hissing with menace. Chasen missed the rat, its movements too quick, and smashed the flashlight on the metal surface. Grab the rolling pin behind you, Jackie called out. In the nick of time, Chasen picked up a heavy wooden rolling pin from the other side of the table and swung down like a sledgehammer, just as the mammoth rat went in to bite his leg. With a vicious splatter, the pin collided with the rat's skull and the threat was eliminated. Chasen looked down on its attacker with pride, holding the rolling pin over his shoulder like Paul Bunyan's axe. No house of horror is any match for me, I don't care what size of the rats they have, Jason said, beaming. You would have been certified rat food if Jackie didn't save your skin, Newman pointed out. Who cares, Jackie said, losing a bit of her edge. Let's get out of here before we awaken another kitchen creature. Hold on, Jason said. I defeated this thing fair and square. It's only appropriate that I give him a proper funeral. Jason picked up the flattened rat by its earthworm tail and held it up, looking around the room for a makeshift coffin. His eyes flashed as he spotted a coal burning oven in the corner, its grate propped open as if beckoning Chasen to cremate the rat. Time for the beast to burn in hell, 
He jumped down from the table and threw the carcass into the oven, slamming the small door shut. Next to the oven sat a box of matches, the only item in its rightful place across the entire room. Chasen took one out and struck it against the bottom of his shoe, cowboy style. You don't have to do that, Jackie warned. Chasen ignored his friend's wisdom and struck the burning match through the grate, dropping it onto the rat. The coal slowly warmed up, a soft glow emanating from the embers. You see it's all harmless, Chasen flaunted to Newman and Jackie. Without a moment's notice, the coal burning oven exploded into flames, sparks shooting from its insides out into the kitchen like fireworks. The rest of the room followed suit, with bombs going off within the cabinets and pantries, fire ablaze everywhere. In front of the door, where the kids had just entered, a light fixture fell and smoldered on the floor, blocking the path outside. They were trapped, and they knew it. How do we get out of here? Newman screamed. Jackie looked around, desperate for a plan. Shielding her eyes from the billowing smoke, she found a closed door on the far side of the kitchen. She then pointed to a bar cart next to Newman. Ram that through the door, Newman, Jackie called out through fits of coughing. It's on fire too, Newman exclaimed. At wit's end, Jackie swung open a cupboard next to her, still untouched by the flames. She pulled out two oven mitts and tossed them to Newman, who threw them on and grabbed the back of the bar cart, miraculously still on working wheels. As hard as you can, Jackie instructed. Mustering all the strength he could, Newman leaned in like a bull in a china shop and let out a behemoth roar. He ran as fast as his legs could take him and smashed through the locked door barreling into the dining room free of fire. Jackie and Chasen followed suit, falling to the floor, and recovering from the extreme exposure to smoke and embers. Behind them, the fire extinguished just as fast as it had started, like someone flipped an off switch. Harmless, huh? Newman asked Chasen, sarcasm seeping through his heavy wheezes. Now is not the time, Jackie said. We can't go back, so we just gotta keep going until we can get back to the foyer. And then we leave, Newman asked. Maybe, she replied, regaining her gravitas. The trio collected themselves and stood up, walking across the dining room adorned with paintings of random figures, all residents of the manor from centuries prior. The table was set with only the finest of silverware and platinum plates, as if someone was expected for dinner. At the end of the dining room was a transition room, consisting of a winding staircase going downwards and a door leading to the back half of the mansion's ground floor. Let's check out the cellar, Jackie suggested. I thought it would go without saying, but if you think that the rats are big up here, just imagine how big they are in the basement, Newman said. I don't know, Chasen chimed in. I've seen enough of this floor to keep going. I say we check out what's downstairs. Just think, if you were hiding treasure, wouldn't you put it in the last place you'd ever want to go if you were a visitor? Jackie asked. Okay, okay, you sold me, Newman admitted, as Jackie led the trio down the spiraling staircase. After a quick trip, seven meters below ground, the group entered an elongated cellar filled with empty wooden kegs stretching across the room. With another staircase on the far side, pipes jutted out from the ceiling, moss growing on the dirt-covered stones scattered around the floor. It was half dungeon, half alchemist's lair, with old brewing technology and wine bottles shattered between barrels. I'd bet a million dollars the treasure is hidden in one of these kegs, Jackie wondered aloud. Chasen was already working to rip the lid from the nearest barrel, seemingly ignorant of the living horror he just escaped minutes prior. The seal finally split, and Chasen tipped the keg over, revealing nothing at all. I'm sure the claustrophobic spirit you just released after 1,000 years of being trapped will treat us well, Newman said. The three friends waited for a fourth presence to arrive, only to be met with silence, followed by a crescendoing drip from one of the rusty pipes above them. Do you hear that? Jackie asked. The leaky pipe? Chasen asked. Yes, Jackie confirmed. It wasn't there a minute ago. We're in a basement, Chasen continued. I'd be worried if there wasn't water dripping from the ceiling. The pitter-patter slowly increased as a slight tremor shook the cellar. Do you feel that? Jackie asked again, once again losing her cool and calm demeanor. Yeah, probably that dumb ghost Newman was so worried about me releasing. Chasen's talkback trailed off, 
as the tremor evolved into a full bent earthquake. Each team grabbed on to the closest stone they could, as the ground shook underneath them, the pipes bursting one by one. Cracks formed in the floor, water seeping through like a broken boat hull. The earthquake peaked and quickly subsided, the kids pulling themselves up to inspect the damage as a light rain fell from the damaged plumbing. First a fire, then an earthquake. What plague could God possibly cast on us next? Jason joked. How about a flood? Newman asked, spinning around as the water, coming both from the floor and the ceiling, pooled at their feet, slowly rising. To the stairs, Jackie shouted. But when the three friends ran to the winding staircase, they found it crumbled, the way back up blocked due to the earthquake. I can't swim, Newman exclaimed, as the water levels rose in a flash, now at their waists. Hold on to one of the empty barrels, Jackie instructed. If they're truly empty, they should float. All three kids wrapped themselves around a keg, the water filling up towards the ceiling. Newman struggled to hang on, however, and slipped back into the water. Help, Newman pleaded, bobbing up and down into the water as he began to drown. Chasen dove off a barrel after his friend as Jackie surveyed the ceiling, the water nearing the top, seconds away from trapping them underwater, leading to certain death. There, at the centre of the room, Jackie screamed, pointing to a perfect circle cut out from the pipes, a handle hanging from the middle of a hidden trapdoor. She too dove from her keg after sucking in the deepest breath she could muster, swimming through the murky, blackened water, until she reached the secret door. Jackie attempted to push it open, but the trapdoor wouldn't budge. She looked around, desperate for help, but couldn't find the two boys. The clock was ticking, and her lungs were at capacity. Jackie closed her eyes, making peace with the inevitable. Out of nowhere, Chasen swam directly into the centre of the door, ploughing it open as he dragged Newman's body through the water. With the second push by Jackie, the trap door flipped open and revealed a secret entrance to the foyer. The water reached the brim of the opening and stopped rising, a fraction of a second too late to end the friends' lives. Jackie and Chasen climbed out from the cellar pool and back into the entryway pulling up Newman's body behind them. Newman let out a few coughs before throwing up a good amount of water, re-entering consciousness. Where are we? he asked. Back where we started, Jackie said, catching her breath. So we can leave, Newman asked, with hope, only for Chasen to crush it instantaneously. I don't think so, he said. The door is gone. The trio of friends turned around to find the front door from which they had entered, completely gone. In its place was an immovable brick wall, no windows in sight. Jackie, Chasen, and Newman were officially prisoners of Mapleheart Manor, with nowhere to go but up. Let's go to the second floor, Jackie said. We can find some rope, smash a window, and rappel back down. I'm down for whatever gets us out of here the fastest, Newman said, as he stood up with the other two, and started up the grand staircase into another story of the unknown. The trio barely made it up ten flights before Jackie noticed something was off. I feel like these stairs never end, like we keep climbing but never get closer to the second story landing. Chasen and Newman stopped to look around, realising the same thing. The pictures hanging on the wall were in the same position they were five steps previously. We should turn around, Newman suggested, and began walking back down the stairs. The other two followed suit, but again they found themselves on a loop, nowhere closer to the bottom than the top. Newman looked over the edge, his fear of height slowly consuming him with dread. He panicked, freezing in place. We're stuck, he said, trembling. We're going to die here, aren't we? Newman looked at his friends with irrational terror, seeping from his eyes, pleading for them to help. You can't panic right now, Chasen said. It's only going to make it worse. As Newman clutched the handrail to secure himself, he let out a little whimper, refusing to take Chasen's advice. Almost immediately, the step underneath Newman's feet gave way, crumbling into a black abyss, stretching miles and miles below him. Newman hung onto the rail for dear life, looking down at the drop to hell, and screaming like he'd never screamed before. Stay calm, Newman, Jackie instructed. The more you freak out, the harder it's going to be to save you. Newman's eyes widened as the steps both behind and in front of him also deteriorated away, as if the staircase was responding to his fear. Increasing the danger, the more he let his phobia take control of his emotions. Newman, look at me, Chasen called out. Newman's eyes locked on his friend. 
In this very moment, his only hope at survival. Remember when we were little, at Big Star Lake in the summer of 2004, you climbed that huge pine tree with all of the confidence in the world, only to look down with terror and get stuck. Newman nodded, his grip slipping. The only reason you were able to get back down is because you tapped back into that confidence. You believed in yourself. It took hours, yeah, but right now you don't have that kind of time. Remember how it felt to get two feet back on air. Feel that feeling. You've got this. Newman shed one more tear before taking his best friend's words to heart. Just as the next few steps crumbled around him, Newman pulled himself up by the handrail and swung himself up to safety. He was just able to grab the edge of the nearest step, avoiding a fall to his certain death. Jackie and Chasen breathed a huge sigh of relief and ran down to him, lifting him up once more. I've saved your life twice now within the span of a few minutes, Chasen said, genuine relief flooding his face. Thank you, Chasen, Newman said, the shock finally wearing thin. No time for pleasantries, Jackie remarked. I can finally see the top floor. She pointed at the top of the winding staircase, a clearing finally in view as the teenagers took their final steps upward. At the beginning of the second story, they came to another split with three separate hallways. I think if we want to get out of here as soon as possible, we're going to have to split up, Jackie admitted. But then who will save Newman? Inevitably for a third time, Chasen asked half jokingly. Newman stood tall, his newfound confidence beaming. I can handle whatever's in front of us, I swear, he promised. Chasen and Jackie shared a skeptical shrug and each friend turned to a different hallway. Jackie took one final glance at her friends before shuffling down her respective hallway. As she walked towards the door at the end of the corridor, she noticed a peculiar haze seeping into the hallway from cracks in the walls, ceilings, and floorboards. It was unlike any fog she had seen in the real world, almost like television static manifesting in the atmosphere and wafted through the air. It severely deteriorated Jackie's visibility, and she squinted through the electric mist until her hand touched a doorknob. She twisted it, half expecting it to be locked. But nevertheless, she was granted entry and slipped inside, closing the door quietly behind her. Jackie found herself in a nursery, as if belonging to a child, sporting a crib underneath the windowsill, draped with colourful curtains. On each side of the bedroom was another twin-sized bed, covered with stuffed teddy bears from the 1930s that kind of looked more like demented sock puppets from a serial killer's collection box than of a comforting playroom. Jackie walked up to the crib to see if anyone occupied the nursery and gasped in horror when she peeked inside and found the rotting skeleton of a toddler-sized human laying on the mattress. Holding back a guttural scream, Jackie slapped a hand over her mouth. She sobbed silently, unable to look back at the remains laid before her. Instead, she ran over to one of the beds on the side, only to find the same putrid stench-ridden skeleton lying under the duvet its eternal pitch black eyes and hanging jaw mimicking a face of horror. This skeleton was of a bigger build, and one just like it could be found in the second twin bed as well. Jackie could only stand in the middle of the room and shrink into a ball, the sights too horrifying to stare at. Her moment to collect herself only lasted a second, however, when she noticed a slithering sound coming from the ceiling. She jolted upright, tears ceasing, and flashed her torch up along the walls. From each corner of the nursery, flying serpents protruded from the wall, like levitating eels, with teeth the size of a butcher's knife. They had no eyes, only a small antenna sticking out of their forehead. They slowly hovered towards Jackie, who had nowhere to run as the door behind her slammed shut, locking into place. Knowing her resourcefulness was the only thing going to keep her alive. She ran to one of the children's beds, and looked down at the skeleton, a final choice awaiting her judgement. <sighs> Breathing in deep, Jackie closed her eyes and crawled in bed with the fermenting bones. She carefully lifted the skeletal figure up and over her body, 
the lingering flesh frosting her with the stench of death. As she held back a coughing fit, the levitating eels slowly hovered by her, trying to smell the scent of their next meal. One of the serpents paused next to the bed Jackie occupied, as if they had detected her presence, but moved away as the rot from the bones was too much to give away her position. The eels slowly went back to the corner of the nursery, disappearing into the shadowy corners as quickly as they had appeared. Hearing the slithering of the snakes fade away, Jackie sensed the coast was clear and leapt from the child's bed, the skeleton clinking to the floor in a pile of remains. She brushed herself off, attempting to rid herself of the carrion stuck to her clothes. As she cleaned her garments, the bedroom door unlocked itself and slowly swung back open. Jackie looked up and saw her friends Jason and Newman walk inside. Their own looks of terror plastered on their faces. You found the exit, Newman proclaimed, pointing to where the baby's crib once stood, now replaced with a staircase that led down into the backyard. Jackie couldn't believe her eyes, but didn't hesitate to run across the room and back into the fresh air of freedom, the rest of the trio directly behind her. They didn't stop once they made it out of Mapleheart Manor, however, but rather ran until they couldn't take another step. Somewhere in the thick of the Vallenberg Willow Tree Forest, the trio stopped to catch their breath. We don't speak of this night to anyone, Jackie said sternly to her compatriots, knowing all three were lucky to be alive. Next year, we will trick or treat, costumes, candy, and no shenanigans, Newman confirmed, and absolutely no truth or dare, Chasen added. The three friends laughed and continued to walk back in the direction of Vallenberg's downtown. As they reached her old station wagon, parked in front of Willoughby's, Jackie smiled as she thought about the evening's events. She looked over at Newman and Chasen, a final time as they got in the car, and took a pause. She could have sworn she saw a flash of yellow in each of their eyes, as if they didn't belong to them, but rather someone or something else. She shrugged it off as extreme exhaustion. Jackie climbed inside the driver's seat, igniting the engine and pulling away into the night of Vallenberg. Certainly a Halloween she'd never, ever forget. Breathing deep, Jackie closed her eyes and reached down towards the fermented bones. She carefully lifted the skeletal figure up, the lingering flesh frosting her with a stench of death. As she held back a coughing fit, she grabbed the biggest bone on the body and ripped it from its last tendon, holding it like a club. She turned and faced the levitating eel slowly hovering by her, trying to smell the scent of their next meal. One of the serpents noticed Jackie in front of it and alerted the others. They all darted at the young girl mouths open and fangs out. Jackie swung with all of her might and clubbed the first serpent that tried to bite her. It flew back into the corner of the room, unconscious. However, it only seemed to make the others stronger, as the remaining serpents hounded on Jackie at once. The attack was too much for her to fend off, and the eels overcame her swings, devouring the girl alive, leaving her skeletal remains to rot like the others, adding to their nursery of death. Newman took one final glance at his friends before shuffling down his respective hallway. As he walked towards the door at the end of the corridor, he noticed a peculiar darkness dimming the hallway, casting massive shadows over the walls, ceilings, and floorboards. It was unlike any darkness he had seen in the real world, almost like the pitchest of blacks doubled in the atmosphere and made the air thick with nothingness. It severely deteriorated Newman's visibility, and he squinted through the shadows until his hand touched a doorknob. He twisted it, half expecting it to be locked, but nevertheless, he was granted entry and slipped inside, closing the door quietly behind him. Newman found himself in a pitch-black room, the surroundings so dark it made the young teenager practically blind. There truly was nothing he could do to see, and when he tried flicking on his flashlight, Newman was unable to cast any light from the torch. It was as if the room sucked all of the light from the things that entered, and it didn't take long for the door from which Newman entered to slam shut and lock behind him. Without much of a choice, Newman stuck out his hand and started feeling for other objects in the room. 
He was scared of touching something horrifying, and slapped at the air with palpable trepidation. He refused to trust himself, despite overcoming so many obstacles the entire night. When he thought he had cleared the room of any objects, Newman came to what felt like a gigantic armoire standing against a wall. From within the armoire, Newman could hear what sounded like the whispers of a thousand souls calling out to him. Every fibre in his body told him to get back, but he couldn't pull away. Newman closed his eyes tight and threw open the armoire, waiting to be attacked by whatever spirit waited for him inside. An unfortunate fate never arrived, but rather the sound of a normal door unlatching and swinging open. Newman opened his eyes to see a single light bulb hanging over his head, illuminating an unsettlingly empty room, sans the armoire, and his two friends who now stood at the doorway. You found the exit, Jackie proclaimed, pointing to where the back of the armoire should have been now replaced with a staircase that led down into the backyard. Newman couldn't believe his eyes, the whispers he heard, being nothing more than the winds from outside. He didn't hesitate to jump into the armoire, run down the stairs, and back into the fresh air of freedom, the rest of the trio directly behind him. They didn't stop until they made it out of Maple Heart Manor, running until they couldn't take another step. Somewhere in the thick of the Wallenberg Willow Tree Forest, the trio stopped to catch their breath. We don't speak of this night to anyone, Newman said sternly to his compatriots. Knowing all three were lucky to be alive. Next year, we will trick or treat, costumes, candy, and no shenanigans, Jackie confirmed, and absolutely no truth or dare, Chasen added. The three friends laughed and continued walking back in the direction of Wallenberg's downtown. As they reached her old station wagon parked in front of Willoughby's, Newman smiled as he thought about the evening's events. He looked over at Jackie and Chase in a final time as they got in the car and took a pause. He could have sworn he saw a flash of yellow in each of their eyes, as if they did not belong to them, but rather someone or something else. Shrugging it off as extreme exhaustion, Newman climbed inside the back seat, the car pulling away into the night of Wellenberg. This was certainly a Halloween that he'd never forget. Newman closed his eyes tight and backed away from the armoire, avoiding the inevitable attack by whatever spirit waited for him inside. As he tiptoed backwards, he felt a string brush the back of his neck. He twirled around, swinging his arm out to hit whatever touched him, but was rather pleasantly surprised when he discovered the string was actually an old light bulb switch, like the kind in his grandparents' attic. Assuming the string would trigger the lights, Newman pulled down, but to no avail. When he tried letting go, however, he found the string stuck to his hand. Panicking a little, Newman used the other hand to pry the string from his body, but again only got himself stuck even more. The more he fought back, the tighter the string clinged to his skin. Eventually, more and more strings fell from the ceiling, and Newman screamed out of sheer helplessness. The whispers from within the armor grew louder, before they were basically inside of Newman's eardrums. Who's there? Newman asked. Almost immediately, the armoire's doors blasted open, and a ray of light from within brightened up the entire room. Newman's jaw dropped to the floor, as a million miniature spiders hung from their webs, his own body now wrapped in the sticky silk of a spider's web. Above him hung the mother spider, a gargantuan arachnid waiting to feed her prey to all of her infinite offspring. She only had to click her pinchers once before the baby spiders launched themselves at Newman. The attack was too much for him to fend off, and the spiders overcame his swings, devouring the boy alive, leaving his memory to be trapped forever, adding to their web of darkness. Chasen took one final glance at his friends before shuffling down his respective hallway. As he walked towards the door at the end of the corridor, he noticed a peculiar red aura filling the hallway, casting an amber glow over the walls, ceilings, and floorboards. It was unlike any vibrancy he had seen in the real world, almost like the colour of fire saturated the atmosphere, 
and made the air thick with fear and rage. It severely deteriorated Chasen's visibility, and he squinted through the glow until his hand touched a doorknob. He twisted it, half expecting it to be locked, but nevertheless he was granted entry and slipped inside, closing the door quietly behind him. Chasen found himself in an ornate billiards room, as if it hosted only members of royalty to play pool within its walls. The fancy drapes and gold-plated furniture were cast in the same red aura as the hallway, giving the sterling billiards room a demonic glow. It all made sense too, when Chasen looked across the room to see the devil himself using a cube of chalk on his pool stick, watching Chasen with an evil grin plastered on his face. Satan, Chasen asked. Indeed, the devil replied. And you must be my challenger. Grab a stick, will you? I haven't got much time. Chasen felt his heart rate rise for the first time as the door behind him locked into place. He looked around and saw a second pool stick hanging from the wall next to him. Understanding he had no alternative, he grabbed the billiards cue from its mantle and walked up to the table. The devil did the same, snapping his fingers to make the pool balls manifest from thin air. I'll take the first shot, the devil said, as he lined up his own cue for the perfect angle. In mere seconds, the devil hit all of his solid colours into the pockets without breaking a sweat, each consecutive shot making Chasen all the more nervous. When it came to the eight ball, the devil took a brief pause to stare into the boy's soul. It was now or never, and Chasen could only do one thing. Chasen confidently watched as the devil returned his focus to the table, called his shot, and poked the eight ball with his cue. It looked like the perfect final shot to settle Chasen's fate. However, at the last second, it slowed down and missed the middle left pocket. No, the devil shouted, knowing Chasen would finally have a go at saving himself. With a newfound confidence and the right amount of adrenaline, Chasen hit every consecutive striped ball of his own into the appropriate pocket. When it came to the eight ball, Chasen didn't flinch and called his shot, sinking the ball into the back middle pocket. The devil cried out as he burst into flames, the red aura in the room at an all-time blinding high. Chasen shielded his eyes for only a moment before the flames extinguished, and the door behind him unlocked and a familiar voice rang out. You found the exit, Jackie proclaimed, pointing to where the back of the devil should have been, now replaced with a staircase that led down into the backyard. Chasen couldn't believe his eyes, the devil's ashes now running down the stairs. He didn't hesitate to jump towards the open trapdoor, run down the stairs and back into the fresh air of freedom, the rest of the trio directly behind him. They didn't stop once until they made it out of Mapleheart Manor, running until they couldn't take another step. Somewhere in the thick of the Vallenberg Willow Tree Forest, the trio stopped to catch their breath. We don't speak of this night to anyone, Chasen said sternly to his compatriots, knowing all three were lucky to be alive. Next year, we'll trick or treat, costumes, candy, and no shenanigans, Jackie confirmed. And absolutely no truth or dare, Newman added. The three friends laughed and continued walking back in the direction of Vallenberg's downtown. As they reached an old station wagon parked in front of Willoughby's, Chasen smiled as he thought about the evening's events. He looked over at Jackie and Newman, a final time as they got into the car, and took a pause. He could have sworn he saw a flash of yellow in each of their eyes, as if they did not belong to them, but rather someone or something else. Shrugging it off as extreme exhaustion, Chasen climbed inside the passenger seat, the car pulling away into the night of Vellenberg. This was certainly a Halloween he'd never forget. Chasen, losing his confidence, watched as the devil returned his focus to the table and called his shot. It looked like the perfect final shot to settle Chasen's fate, however at the last second, Chasen grabbed the ball nearest to him and flung it at the eight ball, interrupting the shot and ending the game. No, the devil shouted, knowing Chasen made the ultimate mistake. How can I beat you if I never get the chance to play, Chasen asked. How do you know I'd make it? 
You are so confident in me, you lost confidence in yourself. The key to billiards is patience, young man. But it seems you ran out in the worst of times, the devil replied, feigning a twisted laugh. Before Chasen could retort, the devil flicked his forked tongue in his direction, pulling out a pitchfork from underneath the billiards table and launching it at Chasen. It plunged right into the boy's heart, setting his body on fire as life drained from Chasen's eyes. He burned as the devil watched over his body, the attack too much for Chasen to extinguish. The flames devoured the boy alive, leaving his pride to be charred into the air forever, left to remind the world of the howls that existed on earth. Ask me anything, Newman said. Are you too scared for a dare? Jackie questioned with all the seriousness in the world. You're going to give me a dare no matter what, aren't you? Newman asked. He's totally scared, Chasen added. I'm not, Newman argued. Fine, you want it that way. Dare me, Newman demanded. I dare you to lead us to Maple Heart Manor, break in under full moon, and explore its haunted rooms, Jackie responded. Newman's face drained of colour, his eyes filling with sadness. He fidgeted in his seat. You didn't actually want to play truth or dare, you just wanted to fool us into getting into one of your little Halloween hijinks, he accused. And here you are, Jackie replied. It worked. Maple Heart Manor has been broken into time and time again for over a hundred years. There's no way we even get close to the property line, much less the house itself. Amateur ghost hunters have been trying since before we were born. No way a few teenagers even sniffed the front door, Newman reasoned. You see, that's what everyone thinks but Halloween gives us the perfect cover. We throw on some costumes to camouflage us all the way to Maple Heart Boulevard, then sneak through the trees and bypass the gate security. It's foolproof, Jackie explained. It's suicide, is what it is, Newman retorted. What are you, scared? Chasen chimed in. First of heights, now of a little old haunted house. Does your coach know you're this much of a wimp? Newman stood up, puffing his chest out. I can handle a dare, Chasen, but can you? because now I dare both of you to come with me. You can't do that, Jason whined, deflating a little himself. Sure he can, Jackie reasoned, and you shouldn't complain either, Jason. You're always desperate for that next adventure. Plus, I'm sure that both of you have heard about the Mapleheart treasure, supposedly hidden somewhere in the house. Isn't all the riches in the world enough to get you to break a few rules? Jason thought long and hard before nodding. I brought a few flashlights with me. They're in my car. We'll drive to the centre of town, park outside of Willoughby's, and walk the rest of the way on foot, Jackie instructed. Sounds like a plan? One last question. What costumes are you wearing? Newman asked. Jackie smiled and started to descend the treehouse ladder, a smile still growing across her face. A couple of hours later, three figures dressed like dying willow trees emerged from the shadows between the actual willows of Vallenberg's countryside. They blended in with the scenery to perfection, as if the branches of the willows danced under the light of the crescent moon. Jackie, Chasen and Newman all took off their masks simultaneously, looking up at the monstrosity before them. Perched on the top of a small hill was Maple Heart Manor, a massive towering mansion with more chimneys than a steamboat and a crumbling facade. It almost beckoned the early evening fog to cloak its ominous positioning. Around the teenagers, the night was still outside of a nearby owl, watching over the abandoned property, hooting as it received visitors for the first time in months. Your plan is brilliant, Newman said to Jackie, in awe of the enormity of the manor. We're still not in yet, Chasen remarked. Jackie looked at him, amused by his scepticism. Lead the way then. Chasen put his tree mask back on his face and stomped to the front of the group, thrashing through the tall grass to create a path to potential doom. At the front door of the haunted mansion was a massive plywood sign that read no trespassing. Down the middle of the poster ran a crack where the door had busted through. Remnants of trespassers long gone. Someone had attempted to chain the front door handles together, but it wasn't taut enough to prevent a small slither from forming in the doorway. A slither small enough for three lanky teenagers to squeeze through. The three friends stopped in their tracks one more time. Should we knock, Newman asks, innocently. 
No, we should be as quiet as possible. No sudden noises, Jackie replied. Yeah, ghosts don't like sudden noises, Chasen agreed. Newman, it was your dare. You go in first, Jackie said. Newman didn't speak in response, but rather turned back to look at the two lifelong pals, fear fastened to his eye sockets, a bead of sweat forming on his brow. He faced forward again, blood draining from his rosy cheeks, and slid through the charred cherry doors. Inside the entryway were high vaulted ceilings, a chandelier the size of a blue whale hanging by a crystal chain in the centre. The stained glass windows were too dusty to allow in much light, casting an indigo glow across the foyer. Furniture draped by old bedsheets and mothball-ridden tablecloths sat scattered about, making literal ghosts stand at attention as the trio all huddled up in the mouth of the Maple Heart Manor. Hello, Jackie called out, her voice echoing through the grand staircase. Chasen looked at her as if worms were burrowed in her ears. I thought the point of being quiet was to be sure we don't let someone know we're here. Or something, Newman added, shining his flashlight around the open entryway. I can promise you, if there was anybody or anything in here, it would have made itself known already. Uh, Jackie, Newman whispered, pointing his torch at the ceiling. What about those? The screech of a thousand bats pierced the musty air as Newman's beam of light disturbed a sleeping cloud of the flying mammals from above. They cascaded over the teenagers, forming a tornado of flapping wings, their cries sharper than nails on a chalkboard. Chasen had the foresight to grab the front door and push with all of his might to open up the slit, wide enough for the bats to sense a way outside. Just as the bats closed in, they felt the draft of the breeze outside and screamed through the gap, their cacophony fading out into the night. Can we leave now, Newman pleaded. Jackie grinned, a look of horror on her face quickly becoming one of excitement. But we only just got to you. We have to honour the dare. No excuses. Chase finally let go of the door, trying to hide his anxiety, slicking his hair back and taking a deep breath. I agree. Let's go. Jackie turned her own flashlight on and shined it to her left and her right, revealing two doors propped open. Let's wait to go upstairs and explore the ground floor first, she suggested. Where to first? Chasen looked to the right, where a carpeted floor and mammoth bookshelves could be seen through the doorway facing him. The study, he said. The three friends walked slowly across the foyer into the study, Jackie guiding them without fear. The study door creaked open as Jackie gently pushed with one hand, her flashlight shaking in the other. An antique roll-top desk that once looked polished, now sat covered with splinters and fungus. Old candles with barely any wax left drip hung lit across the walls, with couches covered with bedsheets sitting in the middle of the room. A few books laid out on the tables, their pages yellowed and torn with age. First bats, now books, Newman observed. What a strange, strange house. I hate books, Chasen said, shooting looks of disgust at the countless titles stretched across the shelves. Almost as if they heard Chasen's nonchalant musing, a few of the books in the study started glowing with an ominous green shimmer, as if beckoning the teenagers to pluck them from their places. Jackie was the first to grab a book from the shelf nearest to her, not phased by the vibrant currents pulsating throughout the cover. She opened her volume and let out a shriek, dropping the book on the floor. Chasen and Newman came over to see what frightened her. What is that? Newman asked. On Jackie's opened page, was what appeared to be a demented camel creature with a ribboned mask covering its eyes. The picture moved like a projection, and this horrifying camel with a twisted face ran down empty streets in the countryside, chasing after a younger version of Jackie. That's a nightmare I had when I was a young girl, she explained. Literally, that exact image was in my dreams so many years ago. Unbelieving it to be true, Chasen ran to another shelf to grab a glowing book for himself. He opened up a random page and had a similar reaction. He held up the book to show his friends a projection of a demon, sneaking up on a younger version of Chasen and stabbing him alive. My reoccurring nightmare, Chasen said, 
It's also here. Newman couldn't wait his turn and was pulling out a green glazed book from the shelf at the same time. He too found a former nightmare stitched in its pages, showing Chasen and Jackie the projection of his younger self running through grassy hillsides in the black of night, a pack of wild dogs yelping after him as they gave chase, eventually catching up with him and clawing at his back. As the fear within each of the teenagers grew, so did the green glow on the books. It was becoming so bright, it was blinding the group of friends who were paralyzed into submission. How do we make it stop, Newman pleaded. I think it's sensing our fear, Jackie guessed. So what do we do, Chasen asked. Don't be afraid, Jackie suggested. It's like Mr. Jones used to tell us at summer camp, Chasen added. The only way to defeat fear is to expose yourself to the very thing that scares you. Chasen led by example and opened his childhood nightmare once more. He stared at the gruesome images, desensitizing himself to the anxiety they caused. Eventually, his fear subsided, as did the glow consuming him. Jackie and Newman watched as Chasen calmed down and looked at their own nightmares the same way. Eventually, everyone became used to the terrors that used to keep them awake at night, and the study returned to its normal state. When the teenagers put the books back on the rightful shelves, one of the bookcases slid over like an elevator door, revealing a secret passage. On the other side of the hidden entrance was a transition room, consisting of a winding staircase going downwards, and a door leading to the back half of the mansion's ground floor. Let's check out the ballroom, Jackie suggested. I may have watched my nightmares in a book, but if I have to dance with them in the ballroom, I'm better off dead, Newman said, only half joking. I'd be prepared for anything if I were you, Chasen advised. I'm sorry we can't all be as tough as you are, Newman snarled back. Stop fighting and think about the treasure, Jackie hissed as she led the trio into the ballroom. Through the double doors, the three friends found themselves in a marvellous great hall with vaulted ceilings and crystal chandeliers. Windows the size of Wallenberg's tallest oak trees stretched from the floor to the ceiling, showcasing a brilliant view of New England's haunted countryside, with the full moon hanging in the sky like a doomsday pearl. At the centre of the ballroom sat a grand piano, and at the piano, playing a spine-chilling song in a minor key, was a poltergeist a ghostly spirit resembling more of a troll than a man. The poltergeist noticed the trio's entrance and smiled at their appearance. We have visitors this evening, the poltergeist remarked to one in particular as he finished up his eerie Halloween tune. Come here children, it's time to play. Around the ballroom fell solid steel beams forming a cage around the poltergeist and the three friends, trapping them underneath the glow of the full moon. I'm afraid none of us know how to play the piano, Jackie replied, timid from interacting with an actual spirit. Oh, the piano is just for show, the poltergeist replied, chuckling. Our game is just a riddle I'd like you to solve. A riddle, Chasen asked. That sounds dumb. The poltergeist giggled even louder. The naivety of the children too much to bear. This is no ordinary riddle. Most riddles, if you get it wrong, you go about your merry way with only a fraction of shame. This riddle, if you get it wrong, you die. The poltergeist erupted with manical laughter as the color drained from each of the teenagers' faces. Are you ready? The poltergeist asked. Jackie, Chase, and Newman all gave each other a final look, no other choice in sight, and nodded sheepishly. The riddle is as follows. The person who built it sold it. The person who bought it never used it. The person who used it never saw it. What is it? The poltergeist smiled devilishly, watching his victims with lifeless, dreary eyes. I'll give you a few seconds, he said. Is it a baby's crib? Jackie answered half-heartedly. The poltergeist let out a gleeful outburst and shook his head, 
building the tension as much as he could before looking at her so far into her eyes he could see her soul. Your answer is incorrect. Jackie and her two friends looked on with horror as the poltergeist pulled a lever hidden within the piano and opened a trap door beneath the feet of the teenagers. Below them was a vat of toxic sludge, bubbling with unparalleled vivacity. As each of the three friends fell into the concoction, they let out a final scream of torturous pain, slowly melting into a potion of failure as the poltergeist watched from above, basking in his wretched game of tricks. Is it a coffin? Jackie answered half-heartedly. Poltergeist let out a gleeful outburst and shook his head, building the tension as much as he could before looking at her so far into her eyes he could see her soul. Your answer is correct. Jackie and her two friends looked on with pure relief as the poltergeist pulled a lever hidden within the piano and opened a trapdoor beneath the feet of the teenagers. Below them was a tunnel into the bottom floor a large pipe opening up to the cellar stairwell. After a quick trip, seven meters below ground, the group entered an elongated cellar filled with empty wooden kegs stretching across the room. With another staircase on the far side, pipes jutted out from the ceiling, moss growing on the dirt-covered stones scattered around the floor. It was half dungeon, half alchemist's lair, with old brewing technology and wine bottles shattered between barrels. I'd bet a million dollars the treasure is hidden in one of these kegs, Jackie wondered aloud. Chasen was already working to rip the lid from the nearest barrel, seemingly ignorant to the living horror he just escaped minutes prior. The seal finally split, and Chasen tipped the keg over, revealing nothing at all. I'm sure the claustrophobic spirit you just released after 1,000 years of being trapped will treat us well, Newman said. The three friends waited for a fourth presence to arrive only to be met with silence, followed by a crescendoing drip from one of the rusty pipes above them. Do you hear that? Jackie asked. The leaky pipe? Chasen asked. Yes, Jackie confirmed. But wasn't there a minute ago? We're in a basement, Chasen continued. I'd be worried if there wasn't water dripping from the ceiling. The pitter-patter slowly increased as a slight tremor shook the cellar. Do you feel that? Jackie asked again, once again losing her cool and calm demeanor. Yeah, probably that dumb ghost Newman was so worried about me releasing. Chasen's talk back trailed off as the tremor evolved into a full bent earthquake. Each team grabbed onto the closest stone they could as the ground shook underneath them, the pipes bursting one by one. Cracks formed in the floor, water seeping through like a broken boat hull. The earthquake peaked and quickly subsided, the kids pulling themselves up to inspect the damage as a light rain fell from the damaged plumbing. First a fire, then an earthquake. What plague could God possibly cast on us next? Chasen joked. How about a flood? Newman asked, spinning around as the water, coming both from the floor and the ceiling, pooled at their feet, slowly rising. To the stairs, Jackie shouted. But when the three friends ran to the winding staircase, they found it crumbled. The way back up blocked due to the earthquake. I can't swim, Newman exclaimed as the water levels rose in a flash, now at their waists. Hold on to one of the empty barrels, Jackie instructed. If they're truly empty, they should float. All three kids wrapped themselves around a keg, the water filling up towards the ceiling. Newman struggled to hang on, however, and slipped back into the water. Help, Newman pleaded, bobbing up and down into the water as he began to drown. Chasen dove off a barrel after his friend, as Jackie surveyed the ceiling, the water nearing the top seconds away from trapping them underwater, leading to certain death. There, at the centre of the room, Jackie screamed, pointing to a perfect circle cut out from the pipes, a handle hanging from the middle of a hidden trapdoor. She too dove from her keg, after sucking in the deepest breath she could muster, swimming through the murky, blackened water, until she reached the secret door. Jackie attempted to push it open, but the trapdoor wouldn't budge. She looked around, desperate for help but couldn't find the two boys. The clock was ticking, and her lungs were at capacity. Jackie closed her eyes, making peace with the inevitable. Out of nowhere, Chasen swam directly into the centre of the door, ploughing it open as he dragged Newman's body through the water. 
With the second push by Jackie, the trap door flipped open and revealed a secret entrance to the foyer. The water reached the brim of the opening and stopped rising, a fraction of a second too late to end the friends' lives. Jackie and Chasen climbed out from the cellar pool and back into the entryway, pulling up Newman's body behind them. Newman let out a few coughs before throwing up a good amount of water, re-entering consciousness. Where are we? he asked. Back where we started, Jackie said, catching her breath. So we can leave, Newman asked, with hope, only for Chasen to crush it instantaneously. I don't think so, he said. The door is gone. The trio of friends turned around to find the front door from which they had entered, completely gone. In its place was an immovable brick wall, no windows in sight. Jackie, Chasen, and Newman were officially prisoners of Mapleheart Manor, with nowhere to go but up. Let's go to the second floor, Jackie said. We can find some rope, smash a window, and rappel back down. I'm down for whatever gets us out of here the fastest, Newman said, as he stood up with the other two, and started up the grand staircase, into another story of the unknown. The trio barely made it up ten flights before Jackie noticed something was off. I feel like these stairs never end, like we keep climbing, but never get closer to the second story landing. Chasen and Newman stopped to look around, realizing the same thing. The pictures hanging on the wall were in the same position they were five steps previously. We should turn around, Newman suggested, and began walking back down the stairs. The other two followed suit, but again they found themselves on a loop, nowhere closer to the bottom than the top. Newman looked over the edge, his fear of height slowly consuming him with dread. He panicked, freezing in place. We're stuck, he said, trembling. We're going to die here, aren't we? Newman looked at his friends with irrational terror, seeping from his eyes, pleading for them to help. You can't panic right now, Chasen said. It's only going to make it worse. As Newman clutched the handrail to secure himself, he let out a little whimper, refusing to take Chasen's advice. Almost immediately, the step underneath Newman's feet gave way, crumbling into a black abyss, stretching miles and miles below him. Newman hung onto the rail for dear life, looking down at the drop to hell, and screaming like he'd never screamed before. Stay calm, Newman, Jackie instructed. The more you freak out, the harder it's going to be to save you. Newman's eyes widened as the steps both behind and in front of him also deteriorated away, as if the staircase was responding to his fear. Increasing the danger, the more he let his phobia take control of his emotions. Newman, look at me, Chasen called out. Newman's eyes locked on his friend. In this very moment, his only hope at survival. Remember when we were little, at Big Star Lake in the summer of 2004, you climbed that huge pine tree with all of the confidence in the world, only to look down with terror and get stuck. Newman nodded, his grip slipping. The only reason you were able to get back down is because you tapped back into that confidence. You believed in yourself. It took hours, yeah, but right now you don't have that kind of time. Remember how it felt to get two feet back on earth. Feel that feeling. You've got this. Newman shed one more tear before taking his best friend's words to heart. Just as the next few steps crumbled around him, Newman pulled himself up by the handrail and swung himself up to safety. He was just able to grab the edge of the nearest step, avoiding a fall to his certain death. Jackie and Chasen breathed a huge sigh of relief and ran down to him, lifting him up once more. I've saved your life twice now within the span of a few minutes, Chasen said, genuine relief flooding his face. Thank you, Chasen, Newman said, the shock finally wearing thin. No time for pleasantries, Jackie remarked. I can finally see the top floor. She pointed at the top of the winding staircase, a clearing finally in view as the teenagers took their final steps upward. At the beginning of the second story, they came to another split with three separate hallways. I think if we want to get out of here as soon as possible, we're going to have to split up, Jackie admitted. But then who will save Newman? Inevitably for a third time, Chasen asked half jokingly. Newman stood tall, his newfound confidence beaming. I can handle whatever's in front of us, I swear, he promised. Chasen and Jackie shared a skeptical shrug, and each friend turned to a different hallway. 